Wow. Uh, that was, and this is, Yeston Davis, a counter tenor who is performing here in Farinelli and the King, playing over at the uh, Velasco Theater on West 44th Street. Wow. Describe what a counter tenor is. In its simplest form, it's male falsetto. But male falsetto is used by lots of singers and not always all the time. So you might hear a pop singer who sings in their falsetto range right at the top to achieve a, an effect uh, or uh, some different color. Whereas what I do is sing all the time in my falsetto range. And I suppose most of the stuff I do is opera or classical concerts. I'm singing repertoire that would have been sung by the castrati in the 18th century. So lots mm. of Handel opera was written for men who unfortunately were castrated deliberately in order to preserve their high voice, but then their body sort of went a bit crazy and they had this power of a, of a mm. tenor, let's say, um, but with a, a treble tone. And so their range matches what we, we can sing as, as countertenors today. Your voice, when yeah. did you know that this would be the range that you would have, or did you? I, it was something that crept up on me. I'd sung as a boy, so I'd had that feeling of what it's Where? like to perform. In a choir in Cambridge, um, in Cambridge University, they have chapel choirs, and I was at St. John's College, Cambridge, and I did that for six years, and then your voice breaks, and I fumbled around singing a bit of bass. My speaking voice, as you can hear, is quite low. Yes, it is. And the good news is that a low speaking voice often translates well into having a falsetto range that, um, don't ask me about the science of it, but... A, 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 higher, a higher speaking, a higher tenorial voice, if you get a tenor to sing in their falsetto, their falsetto tends to be much higher anyway. So I discovered I could sing in my countertenor range kind of by accident. I was bored at school. We were singing something in a school chamber choir. And it came upon me, and I thought, that feels really nice. Um, so I went and explored it, and somebody said, it sounds all right. Um, and it, it was the first time when a spotlight came back on again, which had gone off after my voice had broken. Um, and it suddenly felt special and different again. And that's really why I sing, because it, yeah, it makes you feel good inside. And the added bonus of making other people feel good by enjoying it is, you know, just uh, a when privilege. When did you fall in love with opera? Later on, actually. I, I wasn't really interested or knowledgeable about opera itself till I was nearly in my last year at university. So I was about 20, 22. Um, Do you remember what it was? Yeah, I, I watched a specific production of a Handel opera um, which had been transmitted and put onto VHS in those days at uh, Glyndebourne Festival Opera in England. And it was um, the singer I, I look up to most, uh, countertenor Andreas Scholl, who I've sung with here at the Metropolitan Opera since. Um, and I'd, I'd bought his CDs, I'd listened to him sing, I'd sort of copied the way he sang just to sort of get a feel of what it felt like. And I saw him in a Handel opera and I thought, ah, so you can sing this stuff now, and then it opened a whole world. It's like mm -hmm. reading a book, and you discover which authors they're influenced by, and then day by day I picked up all these other arias and things I could sing, and then I went to London to do postgraduate at the Royal Academy of Music, and that's really where I thought, okay, a lot of this music is for me. The Metropolitan Opera. Yeah. What did you do there, as we show some uh, pictures, and why does it matter? Well, I've just been there singing in um, a contemporary opera which was premiered here uh, called The Exterminating Angel by The Exterminating Angel, Angel. Yeah, which is based on the uh, Bunuel film mm. and um, surrealist piece uh, Thomas Addis, the great British composer has uh, he's had another opera performed here, The Tempest a few years ago which oh, I was yeah. in as well and, uh, but it was, a, it was a great success here um, and I think it surprised a lot of people because you think of the Met, you think of Boheme and Tosca and great Zeffirelli productions and um, an audience in a way who know what they're going to go and see. And here we are throwing them 15 principles trapped on stage and in a <laughs> dining room where they can't escape. It's not Puccini. It's not Puccini. And it got a great review in the New York Times from Tomasini, which really helps um, you know, convince people that it's a good thing yeah. to go and watch. And I think... We had such different audiences from London where we did it and such different audiences from Salzburg. And it was Tuesday night audiences in New York are amazing. It was mm. a young crowd. A lot of young people came to see this. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah. Bring it back home to the play right now that's uh, playing through March, uh, Farinelli and the King. Describe mm. it. It's a play um, based on a true story 
Farinelli was one of these castrati I was talking about. Mm. He was the most famous singer of the day in terms of today. <coughs> he was like a film star, like a, a football star, whatever. And the king of Spain, Philip V, this is around the late 1730s, was going mad. And they decided to uh, experiment with what we would call music therapy. So they called on Farinelli to come from London, where he was performing, and sing to the king and see whether it had an effect on the king's emotional state. And to all intents and purposes, Who it plays did. The king? the king is played by a very unknown actor called Mark Rylance. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he's Not small bad. Guy. Well, yeah, he's, he's, um, yeah, he does mad very, uh, very can well. Can we show a shot if we could, for uh, um, And of the king. Farinelli, stayed, Farinelli stayed there with the king for the rest of his life and for a further 10 years and became um, a fixture at the Spanish monarchy. Opera, Broadway. Give me some adjectives that describe the different. I see a head go like this, by the way. I know. It's incredible. It's such a privilege for me to be able to do both of them in the same season and to do Broadway at all. To be in a play is... I've always dreamt of being an actor, of being in, a, being in that situation rather than necessarily being a singer. So I get the best of both worlds. Um, it's completely different. For a start, we do eight shows a week, uh, of which I'm doing six just so I can survive. You've got to say that voice. I've got to say that voice. We're not amplified at all. You know, You're not? No, not at all. The, all the actors, everybody, we're all unamplified. And this is why we, you know, we, we make sure we're in the right theatre for the acoustics. We make sure that you know, I don't do eight shows a week. And Mark Rylance, of course, ran the Globe Theatre in London, which relies totally on natural light and natural sound. And so he takes that into all his work. And it's, it's a really, really fascinating thing to work with actors and see how they can change one line, one word, and change the whole reaction of an audience. But you only get to see that when you do week upon week of shows. With an opera, we might do seven shows total. So we never really get to see that mm. effect you have. By the way, I'm, I'm in the play right now, Farinelli and the King. Some of the audience actually sits on the stage, or do I have that wrong? Yeah. No, they do. We have this great um, setup where the stage itself is a copy of the Sam Wanamaker Theatre in London. So it's essentially um, uh, the theatre that Inigo Jones planned to build but never built, and which they built in London recently. So we have uh, the two doors at the back where the actors enter and exit, and one in the centre, and then two rows of boxes either side. So it's really Shakespearean. It's really mm. sort of early 17th century. Everybody's right in the thick of it. And you'd think, you know, you don't want to be on stage, you can't see anything, but actually you're, you're part of the action. And if you're lucky enough, Mark might break the fourth wall and, and bring you into it. Um, you that's you the love, exciting thing about it. You love what you do. I absolutely adore what I do, especially right now, because I feel that in this play... The pressure's off me for once. Usually in opera, it's all about the singers, and this, it's about the music, and it's it's about the actors. And so I just get to watch and sing. We wish you and your colleagues and uh, over at Farinelli and the King over at the Belasco Theater, 111, West 44th Street, uh, nothing but the best. Thank you. Thanks so much. We'll be right back right after this. <laughs>